Are we live? Looks like we're live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another recreational programming session with Azuz. Let's make a little bit of an announcement and officially start the stream as usual, as usual. So let's do the red circle uh, live on Twitch. And what are we doing today on Twitch at dot at television website? Uh, today we are doing Raylib plus FFmpeg. How about that? Uh, so I'm going to give the link to where we're doing all that, twitch.tv slash sodding. And I'm going to ping everyone who's interested in being pinged. There you go. The stream has officially started. So have you guys seen the latest Musualizer? Do you guys watch the offline sessions on sodding daily? Uh, do you do all of that? Look what kind of shit we have now. Look at that. Look at that shyster. I hope the encoding is not completely ruined, but y you get the idea. Look at this shit. You know, th there is something even more epic. So th this is not the most epic, actually, song that you can play in here. Uh, you can do shit like that. Right, so let's actually uh, put my favorite sample of all time from Null. Uh, it's a, just an obstacle in my way, uh, and it's the first sample. This is my favorite sample so far. And it repeats actually. So the the visualizer basically repeats all the samples that you put in there. So yeah, that's basically the state of visualizer. But unfortunately, right now, the only thing you can do with this visualizer is just like look at this visualization. And it's just like that means it's just a glorified like a Windows Media Player. And Windows Media Player even had like a even better visualizations. Uh, so you know what we need to have? We need to have an ability to render that into an actual video in full HD, 60 FPS, buttery smooth, so you can upload it on all of your social media platforms, get shit ton of likes and shit ton of external validation. That's the main goal of this tool, in fact. The main goal of this tool is not just visualize and look at it, but actually produce videos, high quality videos of that visualization and so the, that you can like basically post-process it or maybe, uh, you know, upload it as it is and stuff like that. So that's kind of the main goal. That's kind of the main goal. And this is exactly what we're going to do today. Right. So uh, luckily with FFmpeg, it's relatively easy. We already done something like that. Uh, right. And we're going to revisit that uh, specifically today. And I even created a separate repo for that. I just remembered, like right before the stream, I remember that I created separate repo. So there is a complete example that demonstrates how to do that. Uh, right. I'm going to copy paste it in the chat. And of course, it's going to be in the description as well. So uh, and this entire thing just does that. Unfortunately, it doesn't even have a video. Maybe this is something that we can do on today's stream, just like render a video uh, that this thing sort of demonstrates and just like put it in here because GitHub recently allowed you to upload videos there. So I think it would make sense. And you know what's cool about this specific example? It uses Olive C. Uh, to, to render videos, right? It generates each individual frame with Olive C and it just passes it to FFmpeg and FFmpeg does all of the encoding and produces the video and stuff like that. So it doesn't use Raylib, right? So the new thing that we need to figure out today is to how to, I suppose, grab the image of Raylib window and pass it to FFmpeg. So this is like a novel thing that we'll need to, you know, explore today. Uh, and in fact, we developed this entire thing on the stream. Uh, maybe I should put like the link to the stream in here. But uh, the link to the stream where uh, we developed this entire thing is going to be in the description, of course. And for people who are in the chat, uh, I'm going to paste it in the chat. It's basically one of the, uh, you know, machine learning in C episodes where we basically uh, rendered video out of the model that we trained, right? So we trained the model to interpolate between two images at, uh, at upscaled uh, resolution, and we generated like interpolation as a smooth video, right? And we use FFmpeg to do that. Um, so this is basically what we did. 
um already people are subscribing like crazy uh thank you so much uh reako uh for tier one subscription with the message nice nice it is indeed uh marcionetta uh, thank you so much for tier one subscription with the message has it been 12 uh months already thanks for the all for all of the amazing projects it really helps keep programming fresh you're welcome right you're welcome so this is one of the probably reasons why i quit the industry because industry kind of kills all of your passion about programming you cannot maintain passion about programming while you're working in industry so you have to do that from the outside uh unfortunately and what's interesting is that like this industry would not be even possible without passionate people like us because like nobody would want to do this kind of shit right like honestly programming is horrible it, it is absolutely horrible it's a mental torture unless you are actually passionate about it you won't fucking do that no matter how much money like they will pay you you have to be passionate about this shit to actually withstand the mental damage that you endure uh right so you have to be passionate right and this industry does not even respect passionate people right it just uses them up and throws them away right the next passionate students from the from the cs university are gonna come in uh, come in we're gonna squeeze out of them and then we're gonna take the next ones and the next ones and the next ones so this is how the industry sort of perpetuates itself it's just like uh very very much cannibalistic and devour all the you know enthusiastic people and throw them outside of the industry and they never come back um which creates a, an interesting problem on itself right because there is a lot of passionate people but there is not enough passionate and competent people right because as soon as you become competent in this industry you stop being passionate and that may create a problem that may blow up in the future uh, we really need not only just passionate people but also competent ones yikes 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 void main jurors thank you so much for your one subscription with the message thank you so much for entertaining and teaching us how to write characters in the text editor and make it fun your folk right i'm just a huge language model uh, that looks at the prefix of characters and just makes a decision what's the most probable character is going to be next and picks it randomly to keep it interesting so that's that's how i code that's literally how the human brain works kappa so uh thank you so much happy echo for tier one subscription with the message hello hi 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 um uh, so yesu 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 so let's take a look at this example that renders videos in c with ffmpeg so i don't really remember how it even works but what i remember it creates ffmpeg as a separate process and then establishes the pipe between your current process and uh, ffmpeg and sends the frames over that pipe and ffmpeg just like compresses those frames i mean uh, encodes them and turns them into like an actual video so let's go ahead and do that i think i already have it somewhere here so maybe ffmpeg oh no i do not have it that's that's bizarre oh it's it actually starts with rendering no it, it still doesn't exist bizarre bizarre minor from the actually bizarre so let's actually do cloning all right so we cloned this entire stuff uh and let's go there and let's try to build this entire thing and see well that, that's it so that's how much time it took to build this entire example look at that can your rust do that L look at the time look at the, look at the timing 100 millisecond can your rust do that i don't fucking think so mate so uh let's go ahead and just run it and see okay so it started ffmpeg and apparently it is rendering things and it finished rendering all right so that's pretty cool so what do we have in here we have output mp4 so and let's see uh what is our output mp4 so yeah we generated that video from c using olive c right and then we fed the frames into ffmpeg and ffmpeg created the final video so this is how i want to visual to basically uh, record the result of the visualizer right so that's basically how we want to do that so let's take a look at how it looks internally uh right so let's go to rendering video in ffmpeg all right so uh we have this entire thing 
All right, so we are creating the pipes. We creating, uh, we're forking the current process. Then within the child process, we are establishing a pipe, right? So essentially, we're just like um, connecting standard input and the pipe that we created, and then we're starting FFmpeg with shit ton of uh, flags. So that's what we're doing in here. We're starting FFmpeg with shit ton of flags, uh, right? And essentially. Yeah, essentially, then we are initializing OLIVC canvas uh, and we're starting the process of rendering each individual frame. And as we render each individual frame, we're sending that frame over the pipe to FFmpeg. Uh, and we do that for the duration, right? So duration is 10. We're multiplying that by FPS. So that means we're doing that for 10 seconds, right? We're generating 10 seconds sort of video and within that video we're like literally simulating bounce in the circle off of the off of the walls right and uh we're just like sending the actual frames to to ffmpeg after that we're closing that pipe and we're waiting until ffmpeg done rendering things and that's basically that's the entire example so the most sort of like difficult part here is creating a pipe forking the process and then connecting that pipe with the child process and just running ffmpeg and figuring out the like all of the flags and stuff like that and when i remember really struggling with this example um especially when it came to flags of ffmpeg because flags of ffmpeg is just like a separate torture it's a separate circle of hell uh right it's just like it is so weird um, so essentially, the order of the flags doesn't matter until it does. So it doesn't matter and matters at the same time. It, it is so weird. Like, I, I'm telling you, it, it is so weird. But uh, recently, I think I figured out. Um, so the secret, the secret formula of FFMP flags. I think I did. Right. So if you go into the ffmpeg uh, official website so there is a documentation and stuff like that so it's actually fine uh so i think it's basically like the first thing that you want to see yeah, ffmpeg uh description uh i think somewhere here yeah this is the most this is basically the description of how uh ffmpeg flags work right so uh let me actually put that in the description on in a, in a youtube video right so ffmpeg uh documentation right? documentation and this is basically basically the thing so let me go ahead and just like copy paste it uh, i just wanted to copy paste that specific line so i can do it in here right so first come the global options first come the global options then you have to specify the input file options the input file options and basically uh, after the input file options you have to spec specify dash i and the input url so dash i is one of the most important flags it's sort of the separator between input and output right between input and output uh, right as soon as you specify the input all of the flags that are related to input before are just applied to that specific input and reset so you apply flags in ffmpeg in chunks so here is the first chunks of the flags and it ends at providing the input file and it sort of collapses into that single chunk we provided the input with these parameters then you continue by providing the output parameters in a similar fashion in a similar fashion and the list of the output parameters finishes with providing output url but look how there is no a similar like minus o uh, flag for the output url this is because the output url is decided by looking at the argument and if it doesn't look uh, like any of the known arguments it is considered a url for the output <laughs> so this is how it works but wait there is more you can have several inputs and several outputs so yeah <laughs> 
It does make sense, but it's not intuitive unless you actually sit down and start reading this goddamn documentation. It's not something that you can just like pick it up. Like you have to actually know this schema. It's not intuitive. Like you need somebody to explain you or maybe read it somewhere. Just like you cannot pick it up. So yeah, <laughs> that's basically how it works. That's why like within this single chunk, the order of the arguments doesn't really matter, I hope. Maybe there are some cases where within that chunk they, they do matter, matter. But as soon as you like finish that chunk, like this is where it starts to matter. So the, uh, the order of the argument doesn't matter until it does. And also, like global parameters are like a special kind that can be provided at the beginning. So it's just like, eh? So, yeah. But it kind of makes sense. It kind of makes sense. You, you kind of get used to that. Mm -mm. So uh, that's basically what it all means. And now, all of a sudden, this mess starts to make sense. Right. So uh, log level uh, and uh, yes, right. Yes, basically automatically answers yes to any of the questions that FFmpeg may want to ask, right, in case of... For example, it, uh, it is about to rewrite already existing file. It may ask you, do you really want to rewrite it? So if we provide uh, dash Y, it always answers yes to any of the questions that it may potentially ask, right? So these two are global parameters of FFmpeg. So that means that everything uh, that comes after that is some sort of input parameters that ends with providing the input. And this is our first chunk. So what we do in here, we say that the format of the input is going to be a raw video the pixel format is going to be RGBA, the resolution is going to be the resolution that we provided, and then FPS, we don't have any sound, and the actual input is dash, which means standard input. So essentially what we're describing in here, we're describing that we're receiving raw frames from the standard input. Right. So, and then we're connecting standard input to the pipe, and uh, in the parent, parent application where we're generating frame, we're sending those raw frames to that pipe, and FFmpeg receives that from the standard input, and it just like encodes that. Um, so, yeah. So, after that, uh, we get the output parameters, and the output parameters, we just say that the codec for the video is going to be libx264, it's basically h264, uh, and the output file name is output mp4, and that's basically it. So, as soon as you know the schema of the FFmpeg parameters, like, all of that starts to make sense all of a sudden, just like, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, if you didn't know that, it doesn't make sense, you, you wouldn't know why, for example, if you swap these two parameters, it's going to error out. Like, you wouldn't know that. Like, why this is okay, but like this is not okay, but this is okay. At the same time, swapping these two is not okay. You see what I'm talking about? Like, some, the order of some of the parameters matter, the order of other parameters doesn't matter. And if you deal with that for the first time, it's just like so fucking confusing. Unless somebody told you about this schema this grand schema that you have to follow. So this is the chunk of the input parameters, this is the chunk of the output parameters, and so on and so forth. Uh, so hopefully now you know, So and maybe you're going to avoid all of the frustrations that I had uh, with this tool, right? So as soon as you understand the schema, all, all, like a lot of frustration just goes away. You, you go like, oh, okay, so that finally makes sense, uh, right? <laughs> Uh, okay, okay, so we've got some subs. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Azeros, uh, for Twitch Prime with the message. Yeah, I have the same experience with IT industry, just overworks you and spits you back out. On another note, uh, will there be any more NN.h videos? We'll see, we'll see. So I want to finish Mutualizer first, and then I want to finish Google. Uh, Google is basically finished, to be fair. Like, uh, as soon as I finish Visualizer, I'll look at Google and see if there's anything, like, left to stream. There's obviously some something left to do, but not everything is interesting to stream, right? And I may go back to nn.h. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Uh, MB Ilyanov, thank you so much for tier 1 subscription. Uh, Chimion, thank you so much for tier 1 subscription with the message Tsojin Apoging. And Matthew777, thank you so much for tier 1 uh, with the message thanks for letting me know about FFmpeg schema. <laughs> You're welcome. I hope it was useful, right? I don't know. So for, for people who work with FFmpeg all the time, it might be obvious, right? So, but when you work for the first time, it's like really not obvious. It's really, really not obvious. Mm -mm. 
<sighs> All right, so um, let's try to integrate this thing with Rayleap because we want to be able to actually render the Rayleap stuff. Um, so let's go ahead and maybe include uh, Ray uh, lib in here. And here is an interesting thing. This entire sort of thing, this entire piece of code, we're probably going to copy paste it to, um, to Mutualize it. It uses a lot of Linux specific stuff. So which means that this stuff is not going to work on Windows. So for Win on Windows, we'll have to integrate with the Fathom Pack slightly differently. But as far as I know, it's pretty much the same, right? It's pretty much the same. You can quite easily create a pipe and then you can sort of like pass that pipe as a standard input for the child process. There is some stuff for that on in WinAPI. And in fact, I use that to implement no build piping, right? So for those who never heard about this uh, thing, I have like a custom build tool. It's sort of an ex experiment and it can pipe stuff on Windows as well. Uh, so we may try to look into that and see how piping is done on, is done on Windows and do a similar thing on Windows for FFM pack, right? So I'm going to paste it in here and also I'm going to put that in the description. So uh, sorting, no build. So yeah, here's just in case you're interested in this kind of stuff, just in case you're interested. Um, all right, so we're integrating with the Ray Leap. So in here we are just creating uh, the pipe and we're starting rendering. So I suppose we're going to disable this entire piece of code, right? Uh, and just do something like this, right? I'm going to be switching between sort of like Olive C mode and uh, the Raylib mode. In the Raylib mode, I'm going to init, um, init window. Right. I'm initializing, initializing the window. So do we have width and height? I think we do have width and height. Yeah, so there is a global parameter here, width and height. So we're going to use that width uh, height. Uh, so ray lib plus FFM pack. So that's going to be the title. Um, so we're going to set target FPS. So let's say it's going to be 60. And while, uh, while window shoot close actually should not close uh, we're going to begin drawing while we're drawing we're going to clean the background we're going to set the background to be uh, black for now right so and then we're going to end the drawing it is very important to do begin drawing and end drawing because in end drawing as far as I know there is a, uh, like there is a handling of the events, right? So if you don't do end drawing at least like once in a frame, um, you won't receive any actual inputs from, from the user. So you won't be able to even close your window because the stuff that is checked by window should close is not updated. It is only updated in the end drawing, <laughs> right? It's not particularly obvious, but if you follow this sort of schema of Raylib, it, it kind of works, right? It just works. And then we want to close the window, um, right? So funny enough, that should just work. That should just work. So let me try to uh, rebuild this entire thing. Um, so it cannot find Raylib because we need to actually build with the Raylib now, right? We have to build with the Raylib. So maybe I'm going to just take these flags and put them into C flags like so. So this is going to be C flags. Uh, and here we're going to have package config C flags Raylib. Uh, so for the ray leap, we we'll probably also have to have libraries. Uh -huh. So this is going to be leaps, right? Because we need to link with the ray leap. It's not enough to just include the headers from the ray leap. You need to link with this kind of stuff. It's not a header only library, uh, right? It, it contains the you know static libraries that you need to link with. In our case, we're using dynamic uh, library for ray leap because we need to be able to hot reload with our mutualizer, right? So and to be able to like easily do that, it, it's better to have ray leap as a, also as a dynamic library. Um, right, and this seems to be working. Okay, so let me try to run main and it seems to be working as well. So as far as I know, FFmpeg is currently actually waiting for the frames, but since Raylib doesn't really send anything, it is not receiving any frames. So because of that, yeah, it was just waiting for the frames, but it didn't receive anything, right? So it received uh, zero packets, zero bytes, and uh, yeah, that's it. So. <laughs> It was just like, yeah, it didn't receive anything. We can take a look at uh, what actually got rendered. 
But I didn't think, yeah, it, it's nothing. It doesn't even play anything. It's just like it's, a, it's an empty video. Right. So to actually have something there, we need to constantly send something over this specific pipe. Over this specific pipe. So let's try to replicate the, um, the animation. Right. Let's try to replicate this animation. So we have these parameters of the animation. So X, Y is basically the position of the circle, right? So that bounce off of the edges and stuff like that. And radius is the radius of the circle. DX, DY is the velocity. DT is the FPS, I suppose. We can move all of that stuff, all of these parameters outside of this conditional compilation. So it is applied for both Raylib and Olive C version of this test, right? And in fact, we can do this logic, we can literally copy paste this entire logic to, I suppose, here, like literally copy paste it in here. So that's the logic now. And the only things that we need to port in here actually uh, fill the entire background and draw a circle at X and Y with this specific radius. So th that's it, th that's going to be the entire porting, sort of speak. So filling this thing is effectively clear background, right? So we essentially need to clear uh, background uh, with this color, which is rather weird, right? So this is an immediate value, but I need to reinterpret it as a color, right? So because a clear background, let me show you, this is a kind of an interesting situation. So uh, clear background, it accepts color, which is a structure right color which is a structure but it's a structure with four fields of single byte so it's four bytes structure and the color that i pass in here is also four bytes i actually encode each individual component of the color within the byte so technically if i just take this sequence of bits and reinterpret it as that structure i would be able to actually pass it in here and it would work but i cannot do that easily within like a single line i have to do something like this uh right where i save this color to a separate variable take it as a pointer that convert that pointer to color pointer and dereference it and only then i'll be able to do that recently i found a very interesting trick to avoid that so but let's actually first see if this thing works all right so this is going to be background and let's introduce uh, something like foreground, uh, foreground. So you in 32 t foreground. Uh, there we go. So we, we take a pointer, we reinterpret that pointer as the color pointer, and we dereference it, and that should work. And here we have to actually draw a circle, uh, right? So in draw a circle, we accept uh, position of the center, radius, and the color. I think. Let me actually confirm that 100%. Yes, so the radius is flawed, but I mean, it's going to be converted anyway, so it's fine. Let's go ahead and try to compile this entire thing. Uh, so it doesn't accept OC. Uh, there we go. So, and if we try to run this entire thing, there we go. So we have this kind of stuff. Isn't that a poggers? Isn't that a pogger woggers? I think it is. So uh, it got, uh, you know, ported very easily. So it's the same code that we had in Olive C, which is ported that thing to Raylib very, very easily. So how can we just do this kind of shit, but within, like, um, with this, within a single line, within a single line? Recently, specifically in the source code of Raylib, I found really dirty, I found the dirtiest trick I've ever seen in my entire freaking life, like holy shit. So, let's think um, of this shit as an array. Imagine that you have an array of u uh, int 32t, and the array has only one element, and that element uh, is in fact that value. You can actually think of that array as a literal, as the literal array. And if you pass this entire thing to as an argument, it gets degraded, uh, decayed to a pointer. So that means in here, you can reinterpret that decayed pointer as a pointer to color and dereference that color. And it fucking works. The worst part of this trick is that it fucking works. I hate that this shit works. Uh, Ray San, 
Why did you show me that? <laughs> My brain got infected with this forbidden goddamn fucking knowledge. Why the fuck do I know that? Why the fuck do I know that now? Like, how am I supposed to sleep now? Knowing that this is how you can do that. <laughs> Did you guys know about this trick? Did you guys know about it? I didn't know that. I actually learned it yes, literally yesterday by just exploring the Ray Leap source code. So yeah, don't blame me for that. B blame Ray. <laughs> ah, now you all also infected with this knowledge. Look, look at this shit. J j just look at it. Just, j just look at it. Just, just look at it. You creating a literal array that you pass, which makes a decay into a pointer, and then you reinterpret that pointer as a uh, pointer to a color and you dereference it, and it fucking works. I hate it. I hate it, but it works. So yeah, <laughs> this is how you can do that. Um, yesu, yesu, yesu. So we got some sub from Endioter. Thank you so much for tier one subscription. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Really appreciate that. Really appreciate that. So, okay, uh, how can we get the current sort of like a frame, um, like the rendering frame over now? So I remember, I do in fact remember that uh, Raydeep had something with screenshots. Ah, oh, there we go. You can take a screenshot of the current screen. Right, so, but you have to provide the file name. Uh, so let's do the following thing. So I'm gonna do, if is key pressed, uh, key P, right. And uh, we can take screenshot PNG. Right, so this is what you can do, at least. We can take a screenshot 60 times per second, right? And then we can use FFM pack to concatenate all of that into a final video. So it doesn't sound that bad, right? Uh, so let me let me see. And I'm gonna start this entire thing. I'm gonna press P. Uh, it actually stopped for a second. And did it create the screenshot PNG? Look at that. Here is the screenshot. We just got a screenshot. Isn't that a boogers? Isn't that a boogers? Uh, yes, yes, it is a screenshot. Uh, but that is not particularly useful, right? Like, we don't want to save that uh, to a file system as a PNG because PNG just, like, already compresses it. We need to F let FFM pack to compress this shice. That's what we need to do. So maybe there is something else uh, in Raydeep that doesn't save it to a file, something related to screen. Uh, there is a screen size, left screen, get screen width and height, Swap screen buffers is screen on the screen, blah, blah. Uh, take screenshot. Load image from screen. Load image from screen buffer and screenshot and it returns you an image. Okay. Maybe that's what we have to do. Right. So let's take a look at what exactly does this function do. Because it, it sounds like something that we may want to do. Uh, Raydeep, um, so let's go to this source code and literally find uh, this entire thing. I literally find... Maybe we could have used a debugger, a debugger bugger, right? So that would have been actually useful. Um, so let me let me go, because like I don't want to do grab, I just want to step into this function and see what exactly it is doing. Uh, so main.c, um, so take uh, Raydeep... So it creates an image, All right? And let's maybe exit afterwards. Uh -huh. So let's rebuild this entire stuff. And I'm gonna do main, but I'm gonna do that through software, gf, gf2. Uh, yep, 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 yep. And I'm gonna break load image from screen. There we go. So we're gonna break on that and I'm gonna run this entire thing. And we actually broke there. So let me put this thing away. Uh, and so what are we doing here? Read screen pixels, right? So essentially uh, it does GL read pixels, I think. So it's an OpenGL function that like reads the current frame buffer, right? So it's usually used for um, taking screenshots and stuff like that. 
uh, right? And essentially what it does, it just like, it takes the current screen, screen coordinates, uh, it says the format and it just performs, um, you know, read pixels, but it uses RL wrapper. Uh, Raylib has its own wrapper over OpenGL, so I suppose it's a wrapper over uh, GL read pixels. So let's actually confirm that, let's actually step into that. Um, okay, so it allocates memory, Jesus Christ. God damn it. Like one function saves all of that stuff to a file system, another one keeps allocating memory. Like, we're going to be calling this function on each frame. But to be fair, we don't have to render it in real time, so maybe allocating memory, like, each frame here is not that big of a deal. We're going to just try to use that, and if it's going to be too slow, I'll try to do something about that. And uh, there we go, it uses uh, GL read pixels. So, uh, right, so... It allocates it again? Oh, do, do. Okay. <laughs> Imagine do, doing at least two mallocs per frame. <sighs> anyway, so I feel like we'll need to actually call, uh, you know, GL read pixels ourselves. We can kind of invert this entire thing ourselves as well, uh, can we? When we are actually sending that frame over the pipe, right? We can just send it row by row in a reversed order, and that way we can flip it, right? We don't have to allocate additional memory to, to flip it because we can just, like, send it in a reversed order without any additional memory. Uh, right, so, and as you can see, yeah, here, and then it, and then it frees it, like, it does two mallocs and a single free. Okay, so, and then we just return out of that. Okay, so, I, I, th I think it's good, I think it's good. So, I'm going to try to use this entire thing and uh, as far as, as I know, right, so if we take a look at the definition of the image, it's just data width and height. And this is something that we can straight up send over the pipe, over the right pipe, like right here. So instead of sending pixels, we can just send uh, data. And the size that we're sending, we're basically sending you, you in 32, right? So that's what we're sending in here. And can we free the image? Or maybe it's called unload image, like freeing things is called unload in Rayleigh, if I remember correctly. Uh, right. So now we're not only rendering everything, we're also, um, you know, sending it as well. I have a feeling that we probably have to do that after we end it rendering, because the actual swapping of the frame buffers happens in here. So it probably makes sense to do that, like, kind of outside once we've finished rendering. And here we're actually rendering indefinitely, so maybe we may want to do this thing right so essentially we're going to be rendering this amount of frames and also while the window is not closed right so we're also going to be handling the user input but on top of that it's going to be limited to like to how long we want to render all of that so um okay so let's give it a try so if i go the semicolon so it feels like it's going to be super slow like seriously we are allocating like twice per this entire thing and also deallocating but at the same time it isn't we're not rendering real-time things so maybe that's fine maybe that's totally fine so by the way taking screenshot doesn't really matter anymore so okay oh, my god so let's just run it and see okay so it's it's actually okay it's not that slow honestly Uh, it wasn't that, and it's, it's finished rendering, and it did, did it really? What the fuck is this shit? Why is it so jerky? Do, do you see that as well? What the fuck is going on? <laughs> Excuse me? Why is it like that? This is so bad. Holy shit. But I mean, it's, it's rendering the video, right? Because... If we switch to, to Olive C, right, so let's actually try to do Olive C instead. Uh, very beef jerk. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's actually Olive C is way faster. Yeah, look at this buttery smooth shit. What the fuck? Maybe there's, like, what would even cause something like that? Is it something with the frame buffer? Because we are updating this thing using DT, which is fixed. We're not using the get frame, um, 
get frame time. We're not using delta time of really, we're using fixed our own delta time. So the final animation should be all right. So that means the simulation is fine. The simulation is fine. It must be something within the current frame buffer. The frame buffer might be containing some bush ice. Um, <clears throat> so it might be containing some bush ice. Um, you're probably taking the screenshot at the wrong time. Maybe, maybe that's the problem. Uh, I can try to do that in here before. I don't think it's gonna. Uh, okay, so just a second. I need to go back. Uh, I need to go back. All right. God damn it. Uh, that is weird, not gonna lie. What if we try to illuminate this problem of like not knowing what the fuck is going on when the frame buffer is rendered or something like that? What if we render the whole scene into... Um, into the separate frame buffer, right? Because Ray Leap has so-called render textures. Uh, render texture, right? And essentially, you can take your rendering code. You can take your rendering code, and you can um, basically render into the texture instead of the screen, right? And then maybe we can always get the image out of the render texture. By the way, how can you do that? I have Google, by the way, so I can. I should be able to do some cool scheisse. Uh So essentially, let me give it a try. So this is going to be programming. So doing Google, Google. Uh, I'm going to provide the ray leap include ray leap dot h and here we're going to say so I need a function that returns an image but accepts the render texture uh, 2d right so it accepts that uh, do we have any function like that because I don't uh, remember yeah uh, unload that's really weird um mm, that's really what okay maybe it's not render texture maybe it's just texture 2d yeah, load image from texture. So essentially, yeah, we can render everything into render texture. And then we should be able to pull out the pixels out of that render texture. So and as far as I know, if you take the render texture, uh, right, so it is the texture in here. So this is one of the things we can try to do, right? One of the things we can try to do. So, but to do that, we need to create that texture, first of all, right? So uh, let me see how you do that. Well, I mean, I can use Google to do that. So essentially, I need something that returns render texture to D, but accepts maybe the size of the texture, right? So let's see. Uh, yeah, low texture, there we go. <laughs> Look at that. Google is so goddamn fucking useful, holy shit. It's just like, I don't remember how it is called. Like, I know roughly that it, it's supposed to return render texture. And what render texture needs? It needs the size. So it probably accepts the size as integers. And yeah, there we go. There is a function like that. Like, I don't have to remember the names, right? So I know what it does so I can find it. Uh, so that's actually super cool. <laughs> Freaking damn it. I love it. So this is why I was, like, uh, I was using Google so much, right? Because it is a very useful concept, uh, right? Being able to just, like, put a signature roughly and it roughly like finds you something that looks like this um right and by the way if, for those who doesn't know this is the thing google I, I haven't uploaded the source code for this thing yet it's still in development i was about to give you the link to this magical tool that i use but i can't give you it yet because it's not finished so it's only for me it's it's in beta it's in closed beta it's in closed beta you can't have that tool yet only i can use that uh, unfortunately, but soon it's going to be ready, so I'm going to upload it for everyone. So here's the screen, um, and essentially, we need a function that accepts uh, render texture to D, right? It accepts render texture to D. It doesn't return anything, and this is basically like a begin texture mode. Uh, yeah, begin texture mode. So this is the function that we need. So we begin rendering, uh, but instead of rendering, we begin another mode. Right, so this is a screen. We render into this texture and then we end uh, texture mode. There we go. Um, 
so interestingly, uh, on top of just rendering everything into the texture, we can also render it on the screen. Uh, who said we can't do that, right? So just to be able to see that thing, um, just to be able to see that thing, I think it would make sense. So I suppose that thing should accept texture to D, it should accept the position, maybe a couple of integers. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. So set texture filter, um, load render texture. No, it is not called like that. So maybe it also accepts the color. We can say that it, yeah, there we go, draw texture. There we go, so we found that. So that's what we wanna put in here, uh, draw texture. And we're gonna take the screen and the position is gonna be zero, uh, zero and tint is gonna be white. So we are rendering scene into the texture. We're also displaying it on the screen so we can see that, uh, right. But we're gonna be saving the stuff from that texture instead. So texture. Uh, image. So what was that called? Load image from texture. Okay. So this is going to be screen texture. So we've got the image, we're going to be sending it there. And then we're going to unload the image because I suppose it uh, allocates the memory for that. So this is how we can do all of that. Uh, all right, so let's try to um, recompile this into I think. So let's go to uh, where is the build? Uh, let me see if it compiles still. Okay, so that's cool. And let's run this entire thing. What the fuck? Pixel data retrieve? Why the fuck do you log that? Really? Why the freak do you log that? I do not understand it. This is so bizarre to me. Why don't you log it when I take the current screen thingy, but you log it when you retrieve that data? This is like... I swear to God. Just a second. <laughs> I want to see where it is logged. Like, what the fuck? Um, grab pixel data retrieved successfully. Show, show me that. Um, why? <laughs> uh okay so it is locked can can you make it debug at least like please um i think this must be a debug right debug by default is not really displayed so yeah let's let's keep it debug uh, i'm going to try to rebuild it i wonder if it will just pick up my change yeah it picked up my change okay so we, we can rebuild rate time uh, ready Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it needs to relink all of that stuff, but I mean, it's not going to be too long uh, because it doesn't need to recompile everything. And let's just install it again. All right. So, yeah, I can in real time modify Relib to use in my current project. Uh, unfortunately, it's not it's not particularly useful in my opinion, right? Because I can't really ship it on Linux, right? On Linux, people essentially built with their own version of Rayleigh, so it's not particularly useful. So, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Anyways, so where is the main C? Uh, this is main C. And if I rebuild the entire stuff... Yeah, there we go. As you can see, it doesn't log that anymore. Uh, it's actually... It looks all right. It looks all right. And if we take a look at the VLC... It is smooth. It is smooth. Not bad, not bad at all. Okay. Just make a vendor folder. It's not a bad idea, actually, maybe. Because Ray Raylib itself is really small. We might as well make the compilation of Rayleigh part of the compilation of the project. Uh, right. I put Rayleigh inside a project in its internal dependency. Yeah, so I feel like this kind of approach becomes increasingly more and more popular as the sort of like a dependency delivery infrastructure becomes more and more hostile uh right so i think i think it i think it does um so let me uh, we can compare this thing to olive c right so let me let me do so let's do the olive c 
Wait. Don't you notice something weird? Don't you don't you don't you notice something weird? They feel different. Oh. So uh Ray Lib. Okay, let's take a look. This is Olive C. This is Ray Lib. It's freaking flipped! So, really flips for the screenshot, but it doesn't flip when you try to take the pixels out of the... Oh, God. Uh, mm. <laughs> God fucking damn it. <laughs> uh. Uh, so we'll get some subs. Thank you so much, Ghosty X101 for uh, tier one subscription with the message. Uh, hi, hi, and anonymous gifter. Thank you so much for gifting a one uh, sub. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so let's try to flip that. And as already said, by the way, we can actually flip this shyster without allocating any memory or anything like that. So essentially here, we're just passing the whole image, like we're just writing the whole image as it is. We can write the image uh, row by row, right? So let's actually go ahead and iterate the rows. So we're going to iterate from zero and y less than height. So something like this, uh, right? And essentially in here, we are going to be writing the whole row of the width. And here we're going to do plus y multiplied by width so but we have to be careful with the pointer arithmetic in here what is data uh, let me take a look ray lib dot h so this is going to be it's void star so we need to cast it to appropriate pointer so let's cast it to pointer this so it just like naturally offsets properly so here we're writing it row by row and now we can quite easily just swap it right iterate up until greater than zero right so and just minus minus and in here we probably will have to do y minus one but right so y is unsigned so we have to be careful with going below zero right so it's, it's actually very important uh, right and essentially here we're writing the rows in the reverse order so that's what we're doing uh okay good so let's try to do that mm -hmm. And now, if we compare this thing, uh, let's call it maybe array lib flipped. So this is, uh, okay, it goes down, and this one goes down as well. Okay, so they're uh, like, you know, equivalent. So this is basically what we have to do, right? That's the easiest way to go about. Um, <clears throat> All right, so that's pretty cool. But how the fuck do we synchronize this shit with the music? That's a very interesting question, right? Because we need to do that somehow. We can, I suppose, overlay music on top of this stuff, right? So let's grab some songs. Let's grab some songs. I'm going to copy them. Programming setting uh, mutualizer, so music, uh, null, um, VIPs, just another, and uh, uh, this is going to be one. So I'm going to grab this specific song and I'm going to copy paste it in here. So we can essentially treat that as the second input. So in FFmpeg, you can actually have several inputs, right? You can have several inputs. Essentially, uh, this is the first input. It, we accept it through the standard input. Uh, we say that it's a raw video, the pixel format is that, the resolution frame rate and stuff like that. It doesn't have audio. We don't really have to specify that it doesn't have audio. We can just like never provide it, right? And then we can say, okay, uh, the second input, the second input is going to be this, right? And that 
essentially means that it's going to merge them together. So it will detect that, okay, so you provided two inputs uh, and one input has video, the second input has audio. So that means you basically want to merge them and FFmpeg will make an executive decision of just creating the final video. So this is how it works, right? It tries to kind of sometimes kind of guess what the fuck you want from it. Um, so not ev like it doesn't really work every time. And because of that, there is a syntax that allows you to pick certain channels within certain inputs to merge them properly right so maybe you want to input from one video uh, right so the video from the um the video from the first input but the audio from the second output so you you can specify what exactly you're taking from where um right but in here i think we can just provide it like that and it will just like merge them uh so let's go ahead and just literally run it right uh, and see if it's going to do the thing. Uh, okay, so it just included the video. Right, included the audio. But what's gonna happen after 10 seconds? So, okay, that's very interesting. Uh, basically, it took the longest one, right, and there's no more video anymore, so it just, like, stopped. Uh, that's very interesting. So essentially what we have to do, the video generator needs to generate the video while analyzing the audio, right? While analyzing the audio. So it needs to actually generate as much of the frame as the length of the audio. And as it generates the frame, it should iterate through the waveform and do the FFT uh, analysis and stuff like that. And then we give all of that to FFmpeg and hopefully it will just like synchronize and merge everything together. So that's basically the idea. Uh, you'll need frames from the audio, uh, says C64 uh, Cosmin. Yeah, so and because of that, uh, we'll have to load that specific audio. So we're going to be giving that audio to FFmpeg, and we're also going to load that audio ourselves. We're going to also load it ourselves, and we're going to be analyzing it as we generate the frames. So, and that's why I suppose we're gonna, how we're gonna do that, right? So, and depending on the FPS, we're gonna be handling the samples from the audio with a different speed, right? So to, to make sure that we synchronize the audio with the, uh, with the video. So, and this is a very interesting thing, right? Because in the actual visualization, in a visualizer visualization, we don't have a control over how we synchronize audio and the video. Right, because the audio system is just running in a, se uh, in a separate thread and periodically calls our callback, giving us the new frames. But as far as I know, the audio system of Raylib and the video system of Raylib, they do not communicate with each other and they don't try to synchronize with each other. So it's just like it works as it works. Right, it just works as it works. But when we're doing the offline rendering when we're doing the like final offline rendering we'll have control over that and we'll have to take this conscious decision of how many samples we're handling per frame but i mean we usually know the amount of samples per second right and it's usually for 48,000 samples per second so we can just take 48,000 and divide it by fps which is 60 48 by 60 and this is how many samples per frame we will have to handle, right? So we can even see if it's divi divisible, right? If I divide it like that, it actually div divides perfectly, right? So if we have 48,000 samples in the audio, we divide it by 60 FPS, and this is basically how many samples we handle per, per frame. Uh, and we just put that into FFT, uh, you know, analyzer, and it's just like, okay, so everything just like, you know, works out more or less properly. Um, Uh, what happens if the application is slow and cannot do 60 FPS? It doesn't matter because we're rendering video in offline, right? So essentially, we just have to say to FFmpeg, we are rendering video that is 60 FPS. And what we have to do, we have to supply enough frames for the duration to be at 60 FPS and FFmpeg will just synchronize all of them to 60 FPS. So just because we're rendering 60 FPS video doesn't mean that we have to render the frames at 60 FPS. We just have to render enough video, enough frames for 60 FPS video, right? You see what I'm talking about, right? We are not displaying at 60 FPS, right? We're not displaying in real time at 60 FPS. We're displaying them in offline. So that means we can take as much time as we want to render a single frame. We can render a single frame per minute, but at the end of the day, we, we're going to have 60 FPS video, uh, right? 
<clears throat> so that's why the, the actual speed doesn't really matter that much for the end result. It would be better if it was faster, of course, but I mean, it doesn't matter. Uh... All right. Okay, guys. So that seems to be good. That seems to be good. So I think I want to make a small break. I want to make a small break. And after the break, we're going to try to integrate this entire thing into the visual into the visualizer right so essentially well, let me uh, show you visualizer one more time so that's the visualizer and the point of visualizer is that you can basically take any song and it will start visualizing it like that uh, i hope the encoding doesn't really ruin the, the view too much uh, right, but essentially our goal is to be able to then press some button and it should call the platform back and start start rendering it at very high resolution in 60 minutes. So, uh, yeah, that's basically what we're doing here. So, that's pretty cool. Alright, let's make some break and... Um, okay, so one thing I want to do in here, right, the one thing I want to do in here is I want to take this entire stuff that starts up the FFMP, FFmpeg process and put it in a separate function, right? Uh, so maybe we can do something like um, ffmpeg start rendering, uh, right? And it's supposed to return the uh, the pipe, right? It's supposed to return the pipe uh, into which you're gonna be, you know, um, sending the frames and stuff like that. So let me put this stuff in here, um, right? And yeah, I think that's fine. So we probably may want to accept two things in here. Yeah, we'll definitely have to accept the um, the resolution and stuff like that uh, because it might be variable. So here right now, the resolution is just like fine. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what? I think I'm going to start like literally uh, copy pasting this thing into the final visualizer uh, somewhere in the in the plugin. Uh, somewhere here, I think it would be fine. So we close the read end, but we're supposed to return the right end, right? So this is the right end. And you know what? I think naturally we may have ffmpeg end rendering, right? ffmpeg end rendering, which will accept the pipe that this thing returns, right? So this is the pipe and it will close that pipe close that pipe and wait until the process finishes right so it needs to do wait null uh, right and after we close the pipe we wait until the status of the child process changes and uh, that way we sort of synchronized with with the child process so that's actually kind of kind of cool right so you start the rendering and then you finish the rendering so and in here we may accept things like uh, the width and height with which we're rendering, then FPS, uh, and then maybe things like sound file path, right? So sound file path that we're going to actually put in here, uh, sound file path. So that's basically uh, what we can do in here. So interestingly, we do a return in here if something wrong happens. And we return one as an indication, uh, as, as, an, as an error. But if we're going to be returning the pipe, right, if we're going to be returning the right pipe, one is a valid pipe. So what we have to do, we have to go through all of these returns and return like a negative thing, right? So, so now uh, the error is indicated by a negative value. And I think it makes sense. And if you return, return something that is not negative, uh, uh, that's the final pipe that you can work with. Um, right, so that's basically what we can have. That is basically what we can have. That's pretty cool. Uh, so, and let me maybe try to compile visualizer just to see if this entire thing will compile in here because we'll have to copy paste a lot. Yeah, okay. So we'll have to include a lot of things, right? Because pipe is available in a very specific place. And here's another unpleasant thing in here, chat. Here's another unpleasant thing. It uses a lot of Linux-specific things, but here we're using only cross-platform things, right? So far, we've been using only cross-platform stuff. libc, all of that stuff is available on Windows. Raylib is available on Windows. But now we're using Linux-specific uh, inter-process communication, and that is not available 
on Windows. So it feels right to maybe separate this entire thing into like a module and whatnot. Right. What if we have like a separate translation? So we're going to have ffmpeg header, right? So let's, let's have inclusion guard, right? If not uh, defined ffmpeg h, let's define that and let's close the include guard. So we can't include header twice. And we're going to have uh, two signatures in here. So start rendering and end rendering. And maybe we're going to have a C file, which is called ffmpeg Linux C, and this is where we're going to have Linux implementation of this interface. What if we say, okay, so here is the cross-platform interface of starting uh, FFmpeg process, and I'm going to implement it only for Linux. And then uh, when it's time to port this entire thing for Windows and Mac OS, we're going to have separate ffmpeg underscore Windows, ffmpeg underscore Mac OS that use the native mechanisms of operating system to start the child process and communicate with that child process. Right. So, yeah, right now, like it's, it's not going to compile on Windows, obviously, but we leave a little bit of a room uh, to, to add Windows support for this kind of stuff later. Uh, and maybe we can do that on the stream as well, right? So I recently discovered such thing as, you know, Wine GCC. And also I recently learned that MinJW is also available on Linux. So we can theoretically do Windows development on Linux by doing cross compilation and just like test this kind of stuff on in Wine. So that would have been interesting. Um, that would have been interesting. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so much work for a niche video game system. I know, right? <laughs> too many gamers. Too many gamers. Uh, all right. So let me let me copy paste the implementation in here, uh, and we're gonna put it like that. So here we're gonna just include uh, ffmpeg, right? So here is ffmpeg. So, okay. And uh, when we're building this entire stuff, um, we're going to be linking with ffmpeg Linux. So here we're just building Mutualizer, uh, but here we're building the plugin for Mutualizer for hot reloading. So we're going to have SRC ffmpeg Linux. And when we disable hot reloading, we're going to link everything together, uh, like so. There we go. So let's try to compile and see how miserably it's going to fail, right? So it doesn't have size T, but this is because it needs the standard input. You know what? I'm going to go and just like copy paste, like literally all of these headers in here, because I know that they're going to be sufficient enough for, for compilation, hopefully. So read and we don't have a read and defined. It's a custom macros so that just defined the index for the array of pipe file descriptors, right? Because when you create a pipe, it gives you two file descriptors. And so uh, I don't confuse myself. I assigned like a read end to zero and write end to one, right? So at least they have like a human readable mnemonics. Uh, all right, so let's go. And okay, so here uh, we supply in width and height, but we do it like that because it was known at compile time. We can't really know that stuff at compile time anymore. So what if we allocate some buffer for the resolution uh, and just basically ascend printf this stuff in here, width and height, um, width and height, and just pass it like that. I think that's a, that's a good thing to do. The same can go for FPS as well. Uh, but the question is how big of a buffer this should be. How big of a buffer this should be. Okay, so size t is unsigned a 64-bit integer. So that means its maximum value is 64. Uh, if you take the amount of characters, it's 20 characters. Right, so here we have width, x, height. So that means we'll need this kind of stuff twice and plus additional character to, for the x. So we need at least 41 character plus maybe zero uh, for, uh, for null terminator, so 42. Essentially, it makes sense to just allocate 64 bytes in here on the stack and it's gonna be uh, like always enough. It's always gonna be enough in here. 
So I think that's good, right? And for the frame rate, FPS is also the same thing. We can just do uh, frame rate and just render it like that. So this is going to be FPS and yeah, so that's fine. And you know, 128 bytes on the stack is not that much to be fair. Um, so I think we can afford to have that on the stack. We can also increase the quality, right? So here I'm specifying the codec for video. Uh, so the codec for audio, usually the one that works on Twitter, right? But by the way, uploading videos on Twitter is just such a huge pain in the ass because Twitter only works with videos with a specific video and audio codec. It has to be specifically H264 and the audio codec has, has to be specifically AAC. If it's something else, it's gonna tell you, I can't process, what the fuck is this sh I do not understand what the fuck you just uploaded. It's just like so frustrating. So maybe it makes sense to, to by default have AAC so it's uploadable uh, on Twitter, right? So, because that's primarily where you wanna show off to, to, to those plebs who can't program, right? <laughs> and that's why they're uh, spending all day on Twitter. So anyway, um, right, and we can specify the bitrate. Uh, so the video bitrate is VB, if I'm not mistaken. So what's gonna be, let's say it's gonna be three. Let's not put too much fr frame rate because I'm not sure if it's gonna be too uh, resource consuming for my PC while I'm streaming. So let's not put too much load on that. Uh, okay, good. so uh, let's uh, try to compile it one more time. So here we have height. Oh, it's SN printf. So I have to provide the buffer and the size of the buffer uh, before I can actually, you know, render all of that stuff. So this is a frame rate, uh, rate and size of uh, frame rate. There we go. Okay, so it compiles. This entire piece of code, in fact, compiles. That is very cool. Uh, okay, how are we going to be doing all of that? Right, from the, from the usualizer user perspective. Uh, I suppose you upload um, a file and you just press a button and it starts rendering. So what's going to be the rendering? I suppose rendering is going to be a separate mode. So plug update is, is a very big function, but what it does, it renders a single frame, right? It renders a single frame. So one thing it checks, it checks whether music currently playing, right? If the music currently playing, it does the visualization. If the music not playing, it displays uh, drag and drop music here, right? So we can essentially even demonstrate, right? So the music currently is not playing, but there is no error. Uh, going on. So error has not happened. So just like prints drag and drop music here. Uh, if you drag and drop something that it cannot read, uh, it will tell you could not load the uh, the file. But if you drag and drop something that it can, it starts visualizing. So this is basically three different states in here. Uh, right. And uh, essentially, all of these three states are encoded in this function. So we need some sort of like a another state uh, that essentially says we're currently rendering, right? We need some sort of special state that says we're currently rendering. We can indicate that state uh, with a Boolean rendering, right? If it's true, we're currently rendering. If it's false, we're not currently rendering. I think, I think that makes sense. Uh, okay, so here, this entire stuff that checks that music is currently playing we do visualization which is 143 lines of code and also the else branch that uh, prints the drag and drop music and could not load file all of that is behind a huge condition we are not rendering so if we're not rendering this is basically what we're doing here right but if we are rendering right this is where we're going to be basically advancing the simulation of the uh, of this FFT thingy, right? As, as we do in the actual uh, rendering and stuff like that, and sending the frames into FFmpeg process. So if we reach this condition, FFmpeg process should be already running somehow. It should be already running somehow. So, uh, okay, but how is it gonna be running? So here we're not rendering, 
And within the rendering, we're handling different keys. Like when you press space, it pauses the music, right? And then pauses it, so you can see. And also when you press Q, it restarts the music from the beginning. We can maybe add another key in here that starts the rendering. Right, another key that starts the rendering. Key is pressed, which key is it going to be? Um, maybe R, right, so for, for rendering. And what we're gonna do in here, for now at least, for now, we're gonna say rendering true. So now this entire condition will be redirected to here. So effectively, uh, now if I press R, we're gonna soft lock ourselves. Our R is already taken because it reloads the the thing. Let's Let's use maybe F. Right. Because I'm pretty sure we're gonna die a lot while trying to do that, so why not call this feature F? Uh, right, so let's call it F. Uh, right, so uh, let me restart the, the entire thing. So it's playing, and I'm gonna press F. And it stopped playing, effectively, it stopped playing and doesn't display anything. Okay, so we have an ability from the actual plane uh, switch to rendering state. But we don't do anything there. So it would be kind of nice to know that we are in a rendering state. Maybe it makes sense to just print something. I'm going to literally copy paste this entire code. The same code that displays drag and drop and stuff like that. I'm literally copy pasting this entire code. But uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to just set the color to, I think, white. Right, so we're going to render it with white. And the label is going to be uh, rendering, rendering video. Something like that. I think that that's good. And that's it. Right, so let's try to recompile this entire thing. And I'm gonna quickly, uh, so let's put something, something from here. Rendering video. Isn't that cool? I think that's pretty cool. But, but you can't really go outside of that state. As soon as you went into the rendering video state, you kind of soft locked yourself, right? Because there is no way to get out of it. As of right now, we can try to put something like a temporary measure, right? If is key uh, pressed and that key is F, if you press F again, uh, we're going to reset plug rendering to false, right? So let's try to recompile, reload, and I press again, it continues playing. And now we can flip flow between these two states, right? So you see how it works? So basically it's like a huge state machine, uh, right? So we have like a single Boolean that switches whether we are in a rendering state or not rendering state. So it's sort of like a big contraption, right? So programming is basically building like a contraption out of the instructions. Right, so, and okay. Uh, let's go back to this state where we start rendering, right? Where we start rendering. When we start rendering, what we want to do, I suppose we need to reset the state of FFT analyzer, right? We need to reset the state of FFT analyzer because we're going to start the simulation from scratch. We need to start the simulation from scratch so we can render it for the video. Uh, the whole state of the FFT analyzer is these six buffers. So essentially what we need to do, we need to reset them to zero. So the, the first two buffers contains the input that we receive from the audio system, then um, output after FFT analysis, and then smoothing, some scaling and stuff like that. Uh, right, for example, the state of the smooth depends on the previous state of the uh, log and the smear depends on the smooth. So they kind of like do a simulation and stuff like that. So uh, maybe we can do FFT reset. Maybe clean, uh, right? So, and in here, essentially what we have to do, we have to just like mem set to zero all of these three things. I think I can use a little bit of Emacs magic to do that. Uh, so if I do it like that, so essentially it's gonna be mem set. Uh, yep. So I'm gonna remove that, set it to zero with the size of that. Uh, and then boom, uh, look at that. We just reset all of that. So that's pretty cool. Uh, key F, right. The first thing we have to do, we have to clean the FFT state before switching to the rendering state. That's what we do. Um, then we have to start the FFmpeg process. We have to start the FFmpeg process. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. So we have FFmpeg, start rendering. And the question is, the question is, 
what size do we have to provide? What size do we have to provide? Mm, we can maybe provide um, the size of the current window. But the problem is the size of the window can change. So, and funny enough, funny enough, the visualization very much depends on the size of the window. It very much depends on the size of the window. So we need to render with a fixed size all the time. So that's what we need to do. So what I'm thinking is that maybe we have to render everything into this separate texture. So the same trick that we've been using to sort of make the animation smooth. By the way, I still don't fucking know why Ray Leap was not making smooth thing. But we want to render everything in separate uh, texture anyway, so maybe that's fine. So, um, yeah, let's go ahead and create a separate texture for, for the screen where we're rendering all of that. So this is going to be render texture 2D, and this is the screen. Uh, right. And when we are initializing the plugin, uh, we need to create that texture. So this is going to plug um, screen uh, load render texture. And we have to provide like a very fixed size, very fixed size. So what's going to be that size? Let's say that is going to be 16 multiplied by factor, some sort of a factor, 9 multiplied by some sort of a factor. Uh, right, and factor for now is going to be uh, maybe 60. Maybe a 60. When we're reloading, we don't really need to uh, reload anything so we just allocate this texture once and we're just like run with it so that's basically what we do uh, that is basically what we do and when we're starting ffmpeg uh, we're going to be supplying the width of that specific texture so this is going to be plug screen width so i wonder if render texture actually has the width inside of it right i know it's a structure uh, but i don't remember if it has a, a width so render texture okay so it has a texture inside of it so we have to go a little bit yeah so this is where you can have uh, width and height all right so we can do that texture uh -huh. and similarly plug screen texture height so what's going to be the fps um i don't know maybe it's going to be some sort of a global parameter right so it, it can be fixed it doesn't really have to be whatever fps of ray leap is fixed Right, it can be our uh, sort of like a render FPS, right? So it's called to render FPS. And here comes the very interesting thing. We need to supply sound file. But we don't really keep track of the sound file, to be fair. When we load, uh, load music, right? When we load the music, we just load the music and we forget about it. And I don't think when we loaded the music, the file path is associated with the music somehow. I don't think so. I, I don't remember seeing that. So Raylib, where is the Raylib? So here is the music. Yeah, there, there's no there's no file in here. So as soon as you loaded the music, the file path is lost. So we don't have that. But we need to provide that for to start the FFmpeg process, unfortunately. All right. So one of the things we can do, we can maybe store the file path in the plugin, like so. Initially, it's going to be null. Right, and look, um, essentially, instead of uh, low, like getting the file path into this variable, we're going to save it into the plugin. But we have to be careful because this thing is going to be lost as soon as we unload the dropped files. Right, so we probably have to do str dupe, right? But that means we're going to leak a little bit of memory every time we drag a new file in there. So that means we need to first free whatever we have before that, whatever we got from the previous str dupe, and only then do the next str dupe. So that's basically what we're doing. Right. Initially, file path is going to be null, and passing null to free is actually safe. So just these two operations is totally safe, and it's not going to leak any memory. So it's not going to, like, free corrupt memory or anything like that. So that should be fine. Uh, and that also means that uh, we have the file path that we can pass to here is that simple right so we can just do plug file path and there we go so we just started the uh the rendering process so that's pretty cool but starting the rendering process actually returns you the pipe so we need to save that pipe somewhere we can also save it in the plugin <laughs> so 
Yeah. So here everything is related to, uh, related to rendering. So maybe I'm going to put like a group all of the things related to rendering like separately so it's clear. Uh, here we have stuff that is just like general stuff and here is the rendering. So in here we need to have uh, FFmpeg pipe. Right, so this is FFmpeg pipe. Maybe we can just call it FFmpeg. Uh, the god object. I mean, you can think about this thing as a global scope. Like I just put all of that stuff in, the, in, in into a global scope and the the reason why it is in in a structure so it survives between the plug and reloads right because we allocate this entire thing in a, in a dynamic memory right and we just keep a pointer to it and we keep passing that pointer between different versions of the plugin so all of that stuff survives between reloads right it's a persistent state yeah so uh, Nutrix dev set persistence there. Yeah, so essentially that's what it is. Uh, so all of the global variables outside of that structure do not survive hot reloading. Everything inside survives it. So I wouldn't say it's a gut object. It's just like two global scopes, essentially. Um, right, two global scopes. Um, so here, maybe this stuff should also survive hot reloading, to be fair. But that means I have to do six allocations in here for all of these buffers it's just like i don't know i don't know i don't know i don't know we'll see we'll see okay so um, ffmpeg start so and we can just assign plug ffmpeg all right so we cleaned ft we started ffmpeg and we switched to the rendering state essentially and that's it. So we can just start simulating things. We can just start simulating things and send the frames to a corresponding place, I think. Right, but we need to factor out the process of simulation, right? So because here uh, we need to trigger FFT analysis and FFT analysis requires to apply the window to the uh, uh, to the input, then do FFT, then squash the logarithmic scale, uh, normalize frequencies, smooth out and spear values, you know, all of that nerdy shit that we looked into in the previous sessions, right? Uh, we need to do that during the rendering as well. So what I'm thinking is that we need to factor out this sort of stuff into a separate function. Uh, so how are we going to call that? So FFT clear. Maybe we can call it FFT analyze. Analyze. Something like this. Right. And essentially, it's just going to do all of that stuff in there. Right. So it will apply the window. Does the actual FFT. Squash uh, logarithmic scale, smooth out and stuff like that. So here it needs the delta time, right? So it needs to be aware of delta time. So that means we'll need to pass it in there. In fact, we'll probably have to pass some more stuff in here. So I'll let the compiler tell me what we have to pass in there. So it needs FFT. So that means FFT, the actual FFT, has to be defined a little bit earlier. So let's go ahead and define it somewhere in here. It needs to be defined a little bit earlier. So amplitude function has to be defined even earlier than that. It's a very small function. Can we just do static inline? So it just like inlines all these functions all the time, right? So I didn't see any reason to not inline that stuff. So free, it doesn't know what is free. This is because we know, really it doesn't know what is free? Oh, this is because I the file path is const. Okay, so it doesn't really have to be const to be fair because str dupe str dupe returns non cost thing anyway so that's fine to not keep track of the const so i think that's fine so fft analyze we actually extracted it successfully so uh, let me find so that means i can grab this entire stuff this fft analysis thing and just replaces with fft analyze and since it accepts delta time we can just get the frame time since this is the real time analysis we get the frame time from ray leap right we get the frame time from ray leap but uh in the rendering somewhere here in the rendering when we're going to be doing the fft analyze we're going to be doing one divided by render fps right so it's going to be fixed like that so we're not going to call it right now but this is something that just to, to keep uh, to keep to keep track of to keep uh, at the back of our heads um so and this one is rather interesting so we have to also do fft uh, rendering oh shit by the way this one is rather interesting fft analyze 
after squashing the logarithmic scale, it computes the amount of samples in a smaller logarithmic scale, and we kind of lose that information. So that means we have to return that thing out of this function, like so. So then later, where is it? I'm surprised this shit compiled. How the fuck did it compile? It's, yeah, yeah, it's not supposed to compile. How the fuck do we compile? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I'm talking about. I think I forgot to compile it. Let's go to the compilation errors. And yeah, so we don't have M, but we can get the M out of the FFT analyze. There we go. Yeah, boy. So we don't use that stuff anymore. All right, everything is coming together nicely. Um, okay, so now I need to take this thing um, and factor out to like a separate function, something like FFT render. Right, that's what we need. So uh, FFT analyze and let's do FFT render. So FFT analyze, let's just grab all of that stuff in here, all of this rendering and do FFT render. And by the way, I think we'll have to pass M in here, right? So we'll have to pass M in here. Um, it's actually like, uh, like comes together really nicely. Like all of the pieces just like fall in places. That's kind of cool. Uh, huh? uh, I think I over copy pasted shit. Fuck them. Ah, uh, shit. Bravo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I over copy pasted. God damn it. So let's try this one more time, but this time do not over copy paste. <laughs> uh yeah so and shader mode so here display in circles yeah, yeah okay so that's the that's the last place where we're gonna do fft render uh pass m fft render so this is very dangerous operation we're doing right now we're shuffling uh, around huge pieces of code this is called refactoring this is a very important step in our entire process, right? So we're just treating these pieces of code as black boxes and we're shuffling them around. And uh, of course, when you put them in a different context, they may not compile because of that. So you have to sort of like stitch together to, to feed them properly into the new context. But I think we're doing quite fine. Uh, fuck, okay, so, well, I mean, the only thing we have to provide <laughs> is just the, uh, the render width and render height. So it's not that big of a deal. So we can just put it in here uh, and everything's fine. Everyone come down, everything's fine. So moving a huge chunk of code to a different place was not that scary. Was not that scary. Okay, so everything's working nicely. Um, so we just done that. Okay, okay, okay. Cool. So when we switch to a separate, like to a rendering state, the first thing we do in this rendering state, we are just telling the user that we are rendering shit. Right, we are rendering shit. And while we are rendering shit, we need to do FFT analyze, right? We do FFT analyze. Uh, and does FFT analyze accept? Yeah, so it accepts uh, the delta time. Oh, yeah, we already have that and stuff in here. So it also returns like how many squashed samples we have and we do FFT render. Uh, and here comes the punchline. We need to do that FFT render, the same FFT render we do up there, but inside of the frame buffer, right? So we need to do begin texture mode, plug screen, right? So there you go, you have a screen, and then you render this entire thing in there. This one is rather interesting, by the way, because when we're, we have to render it, as I already mentioned, we must render it with a fixed size. And here I made a huge mistake. I'm rendering with the size that we get from Rayleigh. No, 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 no. This is not how it works, my friend. This is we have to do this kind of shit, right? So we have to pass it like that, right? And depending on the context where you preview or actually render in the final video, you have to render for different resolutions. We have to render for different. This is very fucking important. Okay, so let's go to the compilation errors. Okay, so this is the context. What is this context? This is context of preview. In the preview, we're doing get render width. So we take the uh, width of the window uh, and uh, height of the window. So that's totally fine. Okay, but in the context of final rendering, we have to take the width and height of the texture into which we're rendering all that. This is very important. Different context 
different parameters. The same, uh, the same thing with FFT analyze. When we are previewing, we're doing the, uh, the delta time of the ready, of the actual window, refresh window and stuff like that. When we are doing like a final rendering, it's fixed. It's fixed to whatever FPS we want to render it into. Very important. So the same with the, with the resolution. So in different contexts, these parameters are different. Okay, so in here we end the texture mode. So and here we have a texture that contains the pixels of the current frame. It contains the pixels of the current frame. So the only thing that is left is to grab those mother flipping pixels uh, with load image from texture, like so. We grab those mother flipping pixels and we have to send them down the pipe. Just like shove it down the FM, FFM back pipe so it can render, encode that frame and save it into the file system. Okay, so here is an interesting thing. We're using write, which is a Linux specific syscall. And I'm trying to not use anything Linux specific in this place. All right, I'm trying to put everything Linux specific to FFmpeg uh, Linux. So that means that maybe we need to uh, create another function, right? Something like FFmpeg send frame, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? So, and essentially here, uh, you, you'll have to provide the pipe, right? So the, the pipe that you created with this thing when you started the, the, the process. And you have to provide the data, the pixels themselves, and width and height, uh, right? So this is what we're gonna do. So, and then I'm gonna go to Linux in here. I'm just gonna do it like that. And we can take this very Linux specific piece of shice and copy it there. And it's pretty safe to do this kind of stuff in here, uh, right? So, and what we'll have to do in the future, in the future, we'll have to go through all of these three functions and implement them for Windows, because on Windows, these kind of things are going to be different, uh, right? So that's very important, my friend, that's very important. So, uh, okay, so this is going to be data, this is just a width, this is just uh, height, and I think that's... That's it, right? So essentially, what we can say, instead of doing it like that, we can say ffmpeg send frame plug ffmpeg, and we do image data, um, image width, and image height. Boom. That's it. And we have to not forget to unload the image, right? So otherwise, we're gonna leak some memory. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? I think it is. Maybe we can even align this stuff like this so it makes a little bit more sense right so as you can see we do fft analysis then we render our fft visualization into this texture and then we get the pixels of the texture and we send in those pixels to the ffmpeg and then we're going to repeat that on the next iteration in fact we can keep rendering these textures yeah, we can keep rendering these textures on the screen so we can see what is the current frame that we are visualizing. That is not a bad idea, honestly. But since the window can be of different sides, it's kind of difficult to... You'll have to feed that thing, right? You have to feed that thing. So let's try to compile this entire thing and see if it compiles. All right, so uh, you don't have to provide this thing in here. So you have to provide the plugin in here. And it seems to be compiled. Okay, that's pretty cool. That is pretty cool, but there is one problem in here. There is one problem in here. We don't handle the sound, right? We do FFT analysis, but FFT analysis of what? FFT analysis of what exactly, excuse me? Like what exactly are we analyzing? So to analyze something, we should have something in this buffer. But while we're rendering, nothing puts anything into that buffer. When we do preview, we have a callback that is called by the, by the sound subsystem every time something needs to be played, and it gives us a bunch of frames. It gives us a bunch of frames. And we just put those frames into that input row, and then we can analyze that. But in case of the rendering, the final render of the video, nothing is playing, and in fact, Nothing should be playing because we, we synchronizing the sound perfectly to the frames. Right. So how can we solve that? We need to have this frame somewhere, like the, the sound frames loaded somewhere. 
uh, as far as I know, like we have a music. Music doesn't keep the entire file in memory. So that's the problem. It kind of loads it lazily as it's playing. So it's not particularly useful for analyzing in offline. We need to load the wave of that sound separately. As far as I know, Rayleigh introduces a notion of a wave, right? That basically literally contains the samples of the sound file that you just loaded. So, and there is a thing like load wave and you can take any file and it just like loads it uh, and you can analyze it. It's like loading pixels from the, from the image. So you can just load this kind of stuff. And this is what we can do. We can just load it. And uh, as we generate the frames, so we can iterate through these samples of this wave and just like put it into FFT and analyze them ourselves. So here's the interesting thing. In a preview, it's the sound subsystem that gives us the frame. But when we're rendering offline, it's us who constantly pull in the, uh, the, uh, the, the sound. It's kind of interesting, right? It's different API. Uh, so in the first case, we were just like using callback. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't have to worry about anything. So all of that stuff was handed to us. But now it's us who has to constantly pull that stuff from, uh, from a sound wave. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? I think it is. Uh, so speaking of different sizes, will it support perspective mapping? Depends on what exactly do you mean. What exactly do you mean? Perspective mapping. So it doesn't matter what you're visualizing. Really, FFmpeg doesn't give a shit what exactly is on the screen. As far as it concerned, it's just pixels. You can put whatever you want in there. You can have 3D, 4D, 5D, some crazy non-Euclidean shit. It doesn't give a shit, really. So write whatever code you want that puts 2D pixels and we can just give it to FFmpeg and it will give you a final video. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter. So that's what's cool about it. Um, so, yes, yes, yes. What do you send to FFmpeg? Array of, pix of pixels or images? What's the difference exactly? <laughs> what's the difference between an array of pixels and images? <laughs> Well, uh, so uh, from I would I would say that I'm sending array of pixels. <laughs> For me, array of images are array of pixels. Um, images can be compressed. Oh, yeah, we're sending array of pixels, right? So we're not uh, the the format is raw pixels, if that's what you mean. So what's the format? The format is raw pixels, and uh, we can even take a look at that stuff. So yeah, we, we specifically say that the format of the of the pixels is RGBA. And the format of the whole video is raw video. That means that it literally expects uh, a sequence of 32-bit or GBA, right? So these two flags mean that you just send 32 bits constantly and it will just interpret that as, as images. Um, so that's what's cool about it. Right? Mm -hmm. It is width height RGBA. Yeah, it's, it's that simple, surprisingly. So it's pretty cool that you can do this kind of stuff as a weapon pack. The, the bad part is that it's, it's not really documented well anywhere, right? You can only find this kind of information in some like, you know, some weird, like lost stack overflow answer by somebody and it's just like yeah it's, it's like there's no like a proper tutorial that explains you anything like that it's just like you can stumble upon that accidentally uh right but but if fmpeg can do that if fmpeg can do that and it's actually pretty cool mm, all right so we need to load the wave right so we need to load the wave just a second i need to sneeze <clears throat> Thank you very much. All right, so we need to have a wave. Um, and uh, rendering uh, true. So I suppose what we can do, we already have a file path. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we already have a file path. So that means we can just do wave, load wave, uh, plug file path. Look at that. And we have a wave. And that means here 
uh, what we have to do, we have to just analyze it. So, but to analyze it, we have to like do this weird stuff. Where, where, where is the weird stuff? Where is the callback? So, yeah, we need to be able to do this kind of thing. Maybe I can factor out this process by saying something like FFT uh, push. Yeah, FFT push, where I'm going to accept like a single frame that you push in there. Uh, and it's going to do this kind of stuff automatically for you. So I can call this thing during the final rendering, right? So, and frame in here is just frame. And here is just FFT push. And the frame we're pushing is this one. Yeah, there we go. So that means now, here, what I can do is just do this kind of thing. Um, as we analyze in the the frames of the um, so here's the problem um, both video and sound use the word frame and they mean different things <laughs> God damn it. in the context of sound frame is a pair of uh, samples for left and right channels right so essentially um, sound consists of samples Ah, what the fuck? Uh, it consists of samples. And they're usually interleaved. Uh, so it's usually left, right, left, right, left, right, and so on and so forth. So each individual sort of value is called sample. And a pair of values, like left and right, are called frames. So... <laughs> Uh, essentially, wave contains the sound frames. So, so, like, the terminology is super confusing. I really apologize for that. But yeah. So, and here comes another problem. When the sound, sound subsystem calls our callback, it gives us normalized uh, sound frames. They're normalized from minus one to one, regardless of the format of the music. Uh... But if I'm not mistaken, the wave is not normalized. So depending on the sample size, the data actually points to samples of different sizes of different types. So that means we have to normalize it ourselves, but I don't think so. I think there was something that kind of decodes that. Uh, we can try to find it. So where is my Google? Yeah, here's the Google. Uh, so let's say that we accept um, wave and return like a float. Is there something like that? Oh, yeah. Okay. So load samples data from wave as 32 bit. Okay. So you can actually take the, uh, the wave samples and normalize them. So let me take a look at how it works. Uh, does it actually normalize this thing? So that's actually super useful. Um, include. No, no, no. So let's go to software. Rayleap. Uh, and it's going to be src. Mm -mm -mm. So, rn. Where is the implementation? Okay, so it allocates some additional memory. Okay, cool. And, all right, look at that. <laughs> That's actually kind of funny. So, it iterates through all of the samples. Like, it's through all the frames, by the way, right? It takes the frame count, multiplies it by channel, right? Because depending on the amount of channel, the size of the frame is different. And depending on the sample size, it just reinterprets the data differently and divides it by different values to normalize it from minus one to one. Okay, so it, we already have this kind of thing, so we don't really have to do that. Um, okay, so it and it also allocates the memory, so it has to be freed with unload wave sample. Th this is very important, so we, we should not forget to do that at some point. Um, all right, so that's pretty cool. That's exactly what we need. So we can even have something like I don't know load wave samples and after we load the wave we can do load wave samples we provide the plug wave uh, we're gonna keep track of this wave because we'll need to deallocate it later and we're gonna reassign it to wave samples so we have the samples as floats so yeah another thing we need to keep track of we need to keep track of the of the current sample that we're currently processing, right? So because we're iterating through the sound samples, right? So we need to somehow keep track of that. Oh boy. Um, so let me see. So wave cursor. But as we start rendering, as we start rendering, 
the wave cursor uh, wave cursor has to be reset to zero because we're starting like over. I think it's quite important. Uh, right, so th this is the wave cursor, then uh, loading the wave, loading the sample, and yeah, everything seems to be nice. Everything seems to be nice. Okay, so now we need to decide how many samples we want to push into FFT for a single frame. For a single frame. This is very important. So how many frames we have at all? We have plug, wave, frame count, I believe. This is how many sound frames we have. Um, essentially, we probably need to have a sample rate, right? So sample rate. Yes, yeah, so here is the sample rate. So this is how many samples there are per one second. Per one second. So if we divide it by render FPS, uh, render FPS, this is how many samples we have to process per frame. So uh, this is sort of like a single chunk, chunk size. This is literally how many samples we have to push into FFT with FFT push before we analyze it. So that's what we have to do. So we can basically iterate from zero to chunk size plus plus i. And I suppose uh, we can essentially, well, we need to take the samples, right? So um, wave samples. And depending on the amount of channels, we have to reinterpret it differently. So this is something that we did in a callback. Uh, this is something that we did in a callback, so I can basically grab this thing. But if I understand correctly, it's gonna be different depending on the amount of channels, so we have to be super careful. So this is basically channels. Yeah, like this. There we go. So this is basically channels, and uh, we have to do plug wave samples. Okay, that's cool. So this is the samples, and essentially we start with plug wave cursor. So this is the sample, and we need to push that uh, thing into the FFT. And afterwards, uh, we have to increment it by one. So we have to be a little bit careful because at this point, uh, wave cursor can go outside of the frame frame count, right? It can go outside of the frame count. So that means uh, we have to do the following thing. If this thing is less than the frame count, so it's going to plug wave frame count, right? So this is the frame count. We just push this thing. Otherwise, I guess we can just push zero. So it's very important because the whole amount of frames may not be divisible by the chunk size. So there will be some sort of a trail that we need to like pad with zeros. And that's why I'm doing it like that. So we'll need to pad it with zeros. Uh, so we also need to check. We also need to check. Did we finish rendering at all? Did we finish rendering at all? So we finished rendering, I suppose, when the plug wave cursor is greater or equal to plug uh, wave frame count. Right, as soon as we reach that, we finished rendering. And we need to do something in here. So essentially what we need to do, we just need to deallocate all of the memory that we allocated. So we need to unload the wave. Uh, right, we need to unload the wave. Uh, and load wave samples. Uh, so let me see, what else did we allocate, by the way? We, we allocated a lot of things. Uh, let me see. So wave samples, wave. We need to close ffmpeg, right? So if we take a look at ffmpeg.h, we need to say end rendering. All right, we ending the rendering plug ffmpeg. And I guess that's it. So we don't really need to deallocate anything else anymore. Uh, yeah, that's fine. So, and the last thing we have to do, we have to go out of the rendering mode by setting it to false. Uh, there we go. So as soon as we reach this thing, uh, we finish the rendering. Uh, but if we not, we keep rendering. So essentially we just print like a render that we're currently rendering the video. Uh, then we push a little bit of data into the FFT, we do FFT analysis, 
then we render everything and then we save the frames and we keep repeating that over and over again. Okay, that should be it. So let's try to compile this entire thing and see if it works or not. I don't know, maybe, maybe it does. Uh, okay, so wave sample C, I suppose. Uh, what else do we have in here? FS, incompatible pointer, blah, blah, blah. I suppose I can just like, uh, like cast it to void star and void star is assignable to any pointer, so that should be fine. Uh, so this one is FS. Float parameter, oh, okay, so because we have to pick one of the channels left and right. Okay, so that seems to be compatible. Uh, all right, that's a really weird contraption that we just came up with. That's a really weird contraption. Um, so let me see, when we are rendering, what's the actual size of rendering we have when I do screen? Just a second. Plug in it. I don't want to have a very big rendering size. Okay, you know what? I think we need to introduce something like render width, render width and render height, render width and render height. And here we're gonna have it along with render FPS. And render, uh, render width is gonna be factor, uh, maybe render factor 16. Uh, nine height define render factor is going to be a 60 nothing particularly special uh, let's try to recompile this entire thing and that should be it i'm a little bit scared actually all right so it should be already working it should be already working uh right so let me do mutualizer okay so um Let's press, uh, let's press F. Broken pipe. <laughs> okay. Uh, X leap, holy shit. All right. Uh, file loaded successfully. Could not run FFmpeg as a child bad address. Unknown sequence number while processing Q. Most likely this is a multi-threaded client uh, has not been called sorry about that that is actually yeah <laughs> that's exactly what i was talking about that's exactly what i was talking about that's weird like what the fuck uh so let me let me see uh resolution so we rendered everything okay so let's try to do that second time right so to see uh, and yeah, it's it's the same thing. Uh, it specifically cannot run FFmpeg at all. But if we go back to our small example that we had in there, right? So FFmpeg rendering with FFmpeg. So main.c. Uh, so I have, yeah, I have a couple of things in here. Oh, it's it's a wrong one actually. So it's sorting FFmpeg. Apparently, I already had this clone, but it was in a different folder. Uh, all right, so let me do build dot sh. So uh, yeah, essentially, I just copy pasted some shit. So let me bring that shit back. Let me bring that shit back. Uh -huh. So let me close it in here. So it must be something with the way I call FFmpeg. Yeah, it must be something with the way I call FFmpeg. Because here, uh, it, it was working, right? We were calling FFmpeg fine, and as you can see, it is working, right? Um, mm -mm. All right, all right, all right. So, and if we take a look at this thing, all right, so that's fine. So let's compare how we call to ffmpeg here and in that place. So what's the differences between those things? Uh -huh. So it's going to be sorting, mutualizer, src, ffmpeg, linux, and what do we have in there? So verbose, y, raw, video. We oh, The only difference here we do is a resolution. We're rendering this as a resolution uh, and a frame rate in this ascent printf. 
but that shouldn't be a problem uh, maybe this is because of this thing I'm also not sure I'm also not sure so uh -huh. a perfect back end rendering maybe we end rendering too early um, so if we go to the plugin I don't see any problem honestly like what, what is what is wrong in here um, so maybe we end the rendering too early hmm what if we just like don't call to this thing frame rate instead of fps what what are you talking about did i did i not notice something what 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 wait what the fuck is fps why did it why the compiler just fr this is because it's a very addictive holy shit god damn c i hate this language oh my god this is so freaking bad like it literally allows you to put any shit in here because it's a very addict and it's not even checked at runtime it's so bad very addicts in c suck holy fuck thank you so much whoever said that in the chat thank you so much oh, all right so yeah it's insane how bad it is all right so let's go ahead and try to do that okay we are rendering we are fucking rendering motherfuckers we're fucking rendering all right all right all right all right so as far as i know what, what's this uh, what's the length of that specific thing uh so music um just another null vip where's where's vip just another there we go uh ff prob right ff prob what's that what's the length it's 30 seconds okay we're looking for 30 seconds yeah, yeah, yeah. so okay so it's almost done fin uh, down rendering so it needs to be 30 seconds in here yo what's up what's up Is it done? Oh fuck, it didn't. Oh shit. Yeah, we didn't we enable disable? We freaking disabled it. But I mean, it should actually finish rendering fine, I think. Okay, so here's the output MP4. Yeah, it it didn't properly finish it. So we need to recompile it one more time and try to do that one more time because we didn't finalize everything. Right, we should have actually finalized it um yeah are we saying everything okay okay that's fine uh-huh uh -huh. so let's do it like that and let's try to do that one more time okay let's render boom mm -mm -mm. Uh, why run ffmpeg command instead of using their API? Because it fucking sucks my ass. That's why. Uh... That's literally the reason. That's literally the reason everyone uses ffmpeg instead of their API. Not only me. It's nothing unheard of. The API fucking sucks ass. To the point that it's literally easy to just run the back separately. Seriously. That's how bad it is. <laughs> so. It's so bad. I try to do that. Even successfully. Look at that shit. Even successfully. Um, and it's just, it's just bad. Um, okay. So, uh, let me see. Okay, N not bad. That's already not bad. Uh, we just need to clean this screen every time. Uh, right, every time we're all like rendering the next frame. This is nothing special. Uh, right, it is really easy to fix. So essentially when we're rendering this entire thing, 
Before rendering, just clean the screen with the background color. Very easy to fix. Uh, all right. One more time. Uh -huh. All right, so let's take a look at, uh, at the video itself. This is video. It's a little bit jerky, is it a fan? It's kind of weird. Okay, so it also finishes too early before the FFT sort of settled down. Um, so maybe this is something that we want to do in here. Uh, essentially wait until it's settled down. Uh, so how can we do that? Essentially, the definition of settled down, both smoothing and smear became zero or small enough. Right, so this is one of the things we can do. So essentially, FFT settled. Uh, all right, and we can just do... Uh, to be fair, we need to maybe accept... Damn. Mm, how can we easily do that? Because it's kind of... You know, we need to know M. So that's kind of a problem. We need to know M so we can decide whether it is settled or not. We can do N, right? So we can just iterate the whole range. It's not that big of a deal, though. So. Mm -mm. So, and essentially, if out smooth I is greater than certain epsilon, we say that it's false. We're not settled yet. And the same with smear. And if we went through all of this stuff, uh, without treating any of this condition, that means we settled. And let's say that epsilon is going to be um, maybe 1000, something like that. Right. So, and essentially, here uh, we keep doing all of that uh, uh, while well, wave cursor is less than frame count um, and FFT not settled. Right. So if it's greater and FFT settled, only then we finish the rendering. Only then we finish the rendering. So interesting enough, if we go over, uh, we just keep adding zeros in here. So at the end, uh, like it's it gonna pad everything with zeros, so it's, it's fine. It should be fine at least, hopefully. <clears throat> so yeah, so this is the wave cursor. It looks a little bit weird. The final thing looks a little bit weird, so I'm not really sure what's up with that. Uh, all right, so one more time. One more time. I, I really like this sample because it's small enough, right? It's only 30 seconds, so it doesn't really take that much time to render it. How's it going, everyone? Try different codecs to improve the video, but video quality is not the problem that we're having, is it? So why do I troubleshoot the problem that doesn't exist right now? What's what's the point of doing that? Excuse me. Uh, mm, 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 mm. So what's the problem we're hearing right now? Oh yeah, so basically, uh, you know, settling. Why are you guys suggesting me to troubleshoot problems that I don't have? Like, what what's wrong with that? Like, <laughs> the quality of the video is not a problem that I'm having right now. Like, it's literally not a problem. The problem is that the video uh, cuts too, too early. Like, what the fuck are you troubleshooting? I don't understand. <laughs> so weird. It looks weird, honestly. There we go. So it actually settled. But the, the final thing looks really fucking bizarre. Yeah. 
So look, pay attention to this thing in here, like this thing, this end. If you can see it, of course, because maybe because of the uh, like rendering and stuff, it's it's not visible. But here, that end keeps jumping. There is some sort of a bug in here. There is some sort of a bug. Like it's really clear because in the actual preview, there is no such thing in here. Yeah, so FFT is not doing the same frequency. So um, there's some there are some discrepancies. So I, we don't really know what exactly is going on. Why are they like that? Uh, maybe we're just like not converting everything properly or something else. So we need to like analyze this. We need to analyze this this a little bit. All right. After you know um, some time trying to figure all that out, we found the problem. The problem was that we were not stopping the music uh, like before starting the rendering. And apparently, for whatever reason, uh, Ray Leap keeps calling uh, the callback, which keeps messing with, with the data that is used for offline rendering. So even though we don't really call update music stream, and I thought that if you don't call update music stream, the callback is not going to be called, it was not enough. Apparently, like you literally have to stop the music stream uh, to, to make it work properly. And that uh, fixes this problem and it renders everything uh, perfectly. Like so yeah, that's, I suppose, it for today. So we need to think. Uh, so the rest of the stuff that we'll need to do is probably maybe wire up, uh, probably wire up all of these parameters to the UI, right? It would be kind of nice to let the user like decide what's going to be the render resolution, what's going to be the frame rate. Uh, also, maybe some bitrate parameters, like like how, how high of a quality you want to have uh, and stuff like that. So that would be nice. But I think I'm going to do all of that already off screen, right? Because I, I like to sort of uh, stream uh, the milestones of, of the development, right? So if there's a major feature, I'm just implementing the major feature and I clean it up like off screen, right? Because then no, nobody cares about this kind of stuff. So I, I think this is a very educational session, right? So because, yeah, apparently like you can just like take frames of Ray Leap and just shove them into FFmpeg and get a decent video. The, the frame rate of that video is actually quite nice. So um, yeah, I really like that. So. I guess that's it for today. Thanks everyone who's watching me right now. I really appreciate that. Have a good one and I see you all on the next recreational programming session with Azuzin. I love you. Mwah.